the Son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him. This is the word of God. Uh, you could go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> um, my name is Ricky. I serve as one of the pastors here. Kids, it's so good to have you in the room. Uh, happy Father's Day, everyone. Hopefully that goes well today. Um, when I was 12, 12 years old um, and I was in Little League Baseball, my parents bought me a new nice glove. It's actually the, the, like, I mean, it was a really nice glove. And this was kind of a big deal because my parents didn't have a lot of money and I really needed it. And so get the glove, oil, oil it, you know, you, um, you're, you're trying to work it in, get it all flexible, go to practice. Uh, you know, playing with it and everything. At the, towards the end of the practice, we do some, coach makes us do some conditioning. We're running around. We have a little, you know, coach talk with us. And then I go over to where my mitt is supposed to be, and it's gone. And I'm looking around everywhere for it. Can't find it at all. You know, and I'm like, man, you know, this is like my, my glove, right? This is the, my new glove that I got. I'm really upset. I talked to coach. He's like, man, I didn't see it. Hopefully it'll turn up. And you're just like, okay. So then <clears throat> about a month goes into this season, and then I see one of my teammates. And they have a glove that looks exactly like it. And they also have, you know, and you're like, well, maybe that's coincidence. I think not. <laughs> Because I could tell where I'd written, written my name on there that it had been messed with and that it had been covered up. And so I knew it was my glove. I asked my teammate, hey man, you know, is that, you know, I talked to him about it. Oh, they reassure me. Oh no, it's not, it's not mine. They got it. Okay. Talked to coach and he's like, man, there's no way that I can prove that it's your glove. I mean, yeah, it looks like it's, you know, I get it. But I don't know if there's really anything that I can do. Now, how do you think I'm feeling in that moment? How do you think you're feeling? Yeah, thank you. Somebody's in tune. Right? You know, like, I'm like, man, I want justice. Man, I want, I want them to, I want coach to get them. I want them to, like, I want them to admit what they've done. I want the, everybody, I want all my teammates to know that kid took my glove. Man, in the next game, I hope they stink. And I hope they get beamed with a pitch. Bah! Right? I mean, th think, we, we, we all feel this way at times. Right? You're watching a movie, Carson and I, my son, we're watching Avatar 2, and you're like, man, you're watching those bad guys, and you're like, gosh, they're so mean, I can't wait for them to get what's coming to them. Right? You feel it in movies, right? The Emperor in Star Wars, Voldemort and Harry Potter, the mom in Tangled. You're like, get them. You see different things, you see bullying, child trafficking, we all feel this desire for justice. Even on smaller things, you probably felt it this week, you're going in a roundabout and somebody else apparently has no idea how to use that roundabout and you're just like, ooh man, I hope you go to Runza drive through and I hope they overcharge you and skimp you on the fries. Bam. And whoever decided to put and design in all of these roundabouts, I hope they get what's coming to them too. <laughs> Right? We, we all feel this way. Kids, right? Let's think. Think, kids. If you went to school and you took, let's say, your favorite snack, your favorite treat, and one of your classmates took it and ate it, and then the teacher was just like, well, you're just going to go have to buy another one. There's nothing I can do, right? You would be like, man, they took what's mine. We, we all feel this need for justice, for the guilty to have to pay, for those that are innocent and taken advantage of to go free. How does God think about all of these things? How, how does God feel about this? What does God do with those that are guilty, with those that have done wrong, with those that have sinned? Or let's bring it a little bit closer. How does God feel about you when you sin? What does God do with you when you've done wrong? What is he to do with us when we're the guilty ones? That's what we're going to be looking at today. So open up your Bible to Matthew 27. Matthew is in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
be about two thirds of the way through your Bible. So as you're turning there, uh, Jesus, he, you know, he's in Jerusalem. This is Holy Week. He's he's coming up to the cross. He's been uh, Judas has been has betrayed Jesus, and then Jesus is arrested. He's taken to this this Jewish council of the high priests with Caiaphas and all these things, and they're hurling all of these uh, accusations at him. All of the religious leaders. And then now they, they've moved from, from that council now, and they, they've, they've brought him to, to Pilate. And that says um, just there in, in verse 11, now he stood before the governor, uh, Pontius Pilate. And this, this whole thing, as you look at it, as it's already been going, as it continues to go, all of this thing is this sneaky, unjust trial, right? How they're even arresting Jesus is really sneaky, they're, they're all, the religious leaders, they're getting this mob, they're getting this crowd, they're kind of working it to their advantage. They don't actually really produce any real witnesses to anything. They're just, they're just kind of cooking up these witnesses. And all of this thing is unjust, it's sketchy, and it's a lie. And so Matthew, he walks us through this, this trial here, now with... With Pilate. And so we're, to help us look at this and to help us see Jesus in this, we're going to just focus on three uh, characters or three groups of people to help us see what's going on. So the first one is this. We're going to be looking at Pilate, and he's just the self-serving. Pilate, the self-serving. So Pilate, he's the Roman governor. He's, he's kind of the, the main representative there for Rome, there in Israel. And the Jewish leaders, they're taking him. They're, they're taking Jesus to Pilate because they want to eliminate Jesus and they, they want, you know, the death penalty, but they can't carry out any kind of death sentence without the Roman authority, without their approval. And so verse 11, then, uh, wait, now Jesus stood before the governor and Pilate asked Jesus this question, are you the king of the Jews? Because when, when they're bringing Jesus to, to Pilate, they know that Pilate doesn't really care a lot about their Jewish stuff, their religious stuff. They know that. And so they're trying to get Jesus or get Pilate, should I say, to think that Jesus is against Rome, against Caesar. And so in one of the other accounts, they're like, oh, yeah, he claims to be God. He claims to be like higher than Caesar. He's a little bit. He's in defiance of Caesar. He's this revolutionary. And so so Pilate, because this is all the stuff that's coming to him, he asked Jesus, just a simple question. So, are you king of the Jews? Is that who you are? Do you, are you proclaiming yourself as king? Are you, are you trying to move Roman authority out and move yours in? And so Jesus responds, again, verse 11, you say so. Right? Just a very simple, not a big defense response. And it's kind of weird because Jesus, in some ways, he's like saying, well, like, yeah, you're right, but also you're kind of not. Because Pilate, when he's saying, are you king of the Jews? He's like, are you, are you really political? Are you the, this political king? And Jesus is like, well, you say so. And, and in John, you kind of get a bigger glimpse of what he's saying. He's like, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm a king, but not a, not a king like you think of kings. His, my kingdom is, is different. And then in verse 12. While he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus didn't answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear all of these people that are testifying against you? But Jesus didn't answer even one char charge so that the governor, Pilate, was quite amazed. I mean, if you're Pilate, you're used to hearing a lot of people, a lot of criminals, a lot of people coming through that are under some sort of charge. And you're used to a lot of people giving a defense for themselves. I'm sure Pilate had heard a lot of people immediately claim that they're innocent and probably very quickly blaming everybody else. Hey, did you do this? Well, you know what? You know what they did? And he's probably used to seeing a lot of, of guilty people try to defend themselves. But there's something here with Jesus and Jesus' response and Jesus that even isn't really responding to the charges at all. But he sees Jesus' gentleness, his humility, and basically Pilate comes to this conclusion that Jesus is innocent. Pilate comes to this conclusion that he's, he's impressed by Jesus. He's amazed with Jesus. 
And so then in verse 15, at the festival, the governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. So, so now Pilate's kind of calculating this plan. He's like, okay, I don't think Jesus is guilty, but the, the Jews here, they obviously don't like him. They're bringing him before me. And so he's like, I don't want to riot. I don't want any trouble. How can I kind of get Jesus out of this and get myself out of this where I look pretty good? So he's thinking, all right, hey, we usually release a prisoner. I'll just ask the crowd who to release. Surely they'll pick Jesus rather than this other guy that's totally a criminal. They'll be happy. I'll be happy. We'll keep moving forward. Great. So verse 16, at that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, he's saying this to the, to the Jewish leaders, to the crowd, who is it you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew it was because of envy, right? Pilate knows that they, they're doing this out of envy that they handed Jesus over to him. And so that, that's Pilate's plan, all right? This will be how he's going to solve the problem. Verse 19, while he's sitting on the judge's bench, again, that's Pilate, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, Jesus, for today I've suffered terribly in a dream because of him. Now, we don't know exactly how she had this dream or if God gave her this dream, but either way, she has this dream, and she, she's like, man, Jesus is righteous. Hey, Pilate, don't, hey, husband, just, just leave him alone. Don't do anything against him. Verse 20, the chief priests and the elders, however, persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to execute Jesus. So they're going in the crowd. Hey, you know what we should do? Hey, blah, 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 blah. Hey, let's do this. And so they're persuading the crowd. The governor asked them, all right, so Pilate gets back up there. All right, hopefully, hopefully now his plan's going to work. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Barabbas, they answered. Uh-oh. Man. This is backfiring big time for him. Verse, you know, then um, Pilate, all right, what should you, what should I do with Jesus then? They all answered, crucify him. Verse 23, why? What has he done wrong? But they just kept shouting, crucify him. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that a riot was starting instead, took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood. So, so Pilate now, he, he's, he's, you know, he, he wanted to let Jesus go, but they all wanted him to be executed. And now there, there's this, this riot is kind of starting to happen. Now think of this. If, if you're Pilate, who's the actual threat to Pilate's job? Jesus or Barabbas? Right? Barabbas. Bar Barabbas is, uh, it says in some accounts that he's this thief, he's this murderer, he's in a, like an insurrectionist. He's a terrorist. He's, he's very against Rome and is acting out against the authority. So obviously Barabbas is the big threat. Jesus poses really no threat. And so after all of this, this time that, that Pilate doesn't think Jesus has done anything wrong. His wife tells him that he's a righteous man. <clears throat> he actually poses no threat. What does Pilate do here in the end? <laughs> then he released Barabbas, verse 26, then he released Barabbas to them and having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. I mean, you could read that and be like, all right, well, I don't know if that's really that bad, but, but I mean, Pilate... Even though everything tells him to let Jesus go and, hey, Barabbas is the problem, he ends up making this decision to have Jesus flogged. And, and we don't, <clears throat> or maybe your version says scourged. And so this was a punishment many times before criminals even went to crucifixion, but they would be whipped 39 times. And on this whip, they would have like different straps of leather. And in these strips, there would be pieces of metal, bone, and they would whip, whip the, the prisoner, whip the criminal. And I mean, I don't want to be like too graphic or anything, but like, I mean, it, it's like really slicing through your skin, really slight, even deeper than that. Get, maybe getting all the way to the bone. I mean, it's just opening up people's flesh. I mean, and that's the decision that Pilate makes. 
Right? That's the decision that's like, oh yeah, just let them do that. I mean, many times people would actually just die during that process. And they were like, hey, don't ever get to 40 lashes. And so, and then he's like, yeah, go ahead and crucify him. This is Pilate. This is his job, right? He's the one that has the authority here. He's the governor. Now, I know that he says, oh, I wash my hands of this. I didn't really want to do this, but you twisted my arm. That's really him just kind of wimping out. He's not, he's not really innocent in that. Right? Actually, earlier, when Judas goes back to uh, the chief priest, that they, they gave him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus, and he's like, oh, Jesus is innocent, and he throws the coins back at him, and they're kind of, they kind of respond the same way, that uh, Pilate is here, like, well, what's that to us? Right? Pilate here is just wimping out, because he just doesn't want any of this stuff. He cops out. And he gives the orders for an innocent person to be tortured and to be executed. Why? I want you to look at verse 24. Circle, underline, high this. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing. Right? Pilate is doing all of this, sending an innocent man to be tortured and executed. Why? Because it doesn't serve himself. Pilate is very pragmatic. What's, what's going to work here? What benefits me? Man, I don't want to riot. I don't want any trouble with these Jewish people because, man, that might get me in trouble with Rome. All Pilate views Jesus as is what is going to help him or hurt him politically. In John 18, when, when Pilate is talking to Jesus, and Jesus says that, of himself, that he came to testify to the truth about God. And then Pilate asked Jesus, well, what is truth? And then he leaves. He doesn't even stick around for the answer. Again, Pilate's impressed by Jesus, but doesn't change what he, what he does. Pilate doesn't just reject Jesus, but he puts him off to the side. And so Pilate's like this person that knows the truths about Jesus, or at least thinks that they know the truth about Jesus, but it doesn't change their life. They're, they're too distracted by their own agenda, too distracted by their own stuff to really take Jesus that seriously. Again, it isn't just flat out rejection of Jesus, but it's indifference. That's what we see here in Pilate. And I, I just have a question for you. How, how optional is Jesus in your life? How, how do you approach Jesus in a very pragmatic, practical way? Jesus, how do you benefit me? How do you just kind of fit into what I got going here? And sometimes, we, you know, we, when things kind of don't work out, we'll kind of be like Pilate. We're like, well, blah, 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 blah. And we'll kind of give excuses for why we don't really care about Jesus or why we're not going to adjust our life to Jesus. And we'll kind of say, well, it's not really my fault because blah, blah, blah. But really, sometimes it could just be a cop out. Do you ever, how do you approach Jesus in this kind of self-serving way? I think we have lots of times we approach Jesus with this thing of like, how are you going to give me the career I want? How are you going to give me the relationship I want? How are you going to fix my kids? Have them turn out the way that I want them to be? And it's not that Jesus doesn't care about those things. It's not that Jesus isn't capable about those things either. But are we kind of approaching Jesus in a little bit different way than kind of like rather than your kingdom, we're all about serve my kingdom. When Jesus came to point you to something far better, far deeper. That Jesus is saying, hey, I came to show you who God is. Jesus came to rescue you, to save you. Jesus came to show you the truth and the life, the deepest longings of the human heart. Jesus is like, that's what I want to get at, not just have, help you have a nice career. To know him is eternal life, and his presence is the fullness of joy. What if, what if you, what if we took our agendas and our wonderings about how Jesus can serve us. And we just said, Jesus, just please show me who you are and show me what you want me to do and be. This isn't about serving me. Show me who you are, Jesus, and help me to follow. 
So that's just the, f- the first person that we see here is Pilate. The self-serving next group is this. The religious leaders in the crowd. They're the suede and the cruel. Right? I mean, they, they, they take Jesus to Pilate, to the Roman governor. And they, they, don't, they don't care about Rome, the Jewish leaders, the, the crowd. They don't care about Rome. They don't like Rome. They just want to eliminate Jesus because of their jealousy. Right? Even in verse 18, Pilate knows, man, you're doing this because you're envious. You're doing this because you're jealous. Because Jesus is this threat to you, to your position, your power. Even before this trial, they're having this secret meeting at the high priest's house, trying to basically conspire against Jesus. And then just think, I mean, as as it's been leading up, this group of religious leaders, the people that are reading their Bible, continue down this path, decision after decision after decision, to get Jesus and put him to death. I mean, whoa. Whoa. I mean, I've been mad before, but man, those, I mean, that's getting somewhere. I mean, and think of all of these other places, because the, the, the crowd, the religious leaders, they're so convinced Jesus is guilty, at least to some sort of degree. But in all of this miss, Matthew is making it so clear to us, Jesus is innocent. Right? Judas, the, even the one who betrayed Jesus, Judas comes to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent. This Gentile woman... In Pilate's wife, she comes to the conclusion that she can recognize it. Pilate, who is a very harsh governor, harsh ruler of the land, he comes to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent. But the Jewish leaders in the crowds refuse to. The crowd just seems to go with the flow, right? The Jewish leaders just come in the crowd, whisper, whisper, whisper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great idea. I mean, what? What? And what happens here is Jesus, Jesus, the one who healed the sick, Jesus, the one who fed thousands, Jesus, the one that preached and taught, love your enemies, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit. He's dismissed for a murderous terrorist. And the religious leaders, along with the crowd, they're just easily swayed and they ask, give us Barabbas. And then on top of that, when they say, when Pilate asks, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They say, crucify him. Right? I mean, they could have said something else. They could have said, put him in jail. Give him a hefty fine. But no, they're like, oh, let's crucify him. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, but it was perfected by the Romans. And basically... Crucifixion was, was this, this think tank of how can we make it the most absolutely excruciating, painful way to die? Well, there we go. Even that word that we have excruciating comes from crucifixion. Caused so much pain. And so they would, they would nail spikes into their wrists and into their ankles and put them you know, up on a cross beam. And it would hit the medial nerve in your arm. And so every time, it, I mean, just the, that, the, the pain of having these nails in your wrists and in your feet. And what you would need to do, anybody that was being crucified, they would have to like pull themselves up or push up on their feet, causing even just more pain to just like catch a breath. Many times they either bled out or just died of, of basically just not being able to breathe. And that's what the crowd is like. Yeah. Send them that way. The most brutal way to die and it's so publicly shameful. Not just painful. Crucifixion was so offensive to Romans that Roman citizens couldn't be. It was even more offensive to Jews. You know, cursed from Deuteronomy 21. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And so you even notice it here. Crucifixion couldn't take place within the city. They had to send them out of the city because it was so appalling. How did they get to this place? How did the crowd, how did these religious leaders get to this place? Because they're the ones that think they're the good guys. They're the ones that are at synagogue. They're the ones that have more access to, to God's word, to these scrolls. Verse 18, Pilate says, man, I know. He knows why they're doing it, because of envy. Jesus is a threat to your system, to your religious establishment to your position, to your power. 
The crowd is basically just swayed because they're listening to the voices, right? They're, they're not thinking about what they're being told. They didn't listen to the word of God. They're blinded. I think for us, this should cause us to be very mindful of what are the voices that you're listening to? What is the system that you are serving or or the affiliations with certain groups or dare I say parties that might be saying different things that are not in a line with God's word and what God has said? Because we will easily be like, well, yeah, that's totally right. That's totally right. And we start to serve a system rather than our savior. We're listening sometimes to the wrong voices. And so here, they're mocking Jesus actually for, I mean, almost exactly who he is. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, just imagine this. There's this man, even if you don't know him, there's this man up there that is under, I mean, like his, his, his flesh is totally exposed. Maybe even his bones are exposed. And then these Roman soldiers are just heaping insults on him. They put a crown of thorns on him. Pretend to mock him and bow down to him. Hail, king of the Jews. And the irony is, is actually you bowing down to him is exactly what you should be doing. When they get him, you know, they, they, after this, they have, they lead him out of town. They have, they pick a random person. This person isn't there to help Jesus. Jesus is totally alone. Pick Simon of Cyrene, force him to carry the cross the rest of the way because Jesus is most likely too physically weak. They crucify him, they nail him up on to the cross, and they put him up there. And then even again, if you didn't know him, but as as he's up there in excruciating pain, they're just hurling moral insults. Even the, the criminals next to him are. Save yourself. Prove yourself that you're the Son of God. Which is, they don't know it, but Jesus is actually proving himself to be the son of God more than they could ever realize. Hop off, come off. It's the last thing that they would want Jesus to actually do. See, we want God to prove it on our terms, but we need Jesus on his terms. And so they're mocking Jesus. In all of this scene, in all this situation, you're just seeing the worst of humanity. The worst of us. Just going to Jesus. Mocking him as king. Mocking him as somebody who's trusted God. Mocking him as the son of God. If you're the son of God, come down. The height of wickedness is reached as people seize God in flesh. Judge him, arrest him, reject him, and send him to his death. So by this crowd that's just swayed and cruel. Last person we're going to be looking at is Barabbas. Barabbas the, the spared. So Barabbas, he, he was a, a murderer, an insurrectionist, kind of a terrorist that would have um, been very much against Rome, against these, uh, the authorities. Some people maybe even appreciated Barabbas to a degree. But even as the crowd, as the chief priests, as the religious leaders are yelling, Man, give us Barabbas. Barabbas most likely doesn't like them. Barabbas most likely thinks that they're part of the problem. You're part of the authority problem. You know, all of these things need to be totally changed. You guys need to be out. But yet the crowd yells for him. I mean, think of, think of what this day is like maybe for Barabbas. I mean, he could have been sitting in his jail cell. And what does he think is going to happen to him later that day? Barabbas is thinking, man, this is the day I'm going to die. Maybe he can hear it out of his window. Here's Pilate. Who do you want me to give to you? Barabbas? Who do you want me to release? Barabbas or Jesus? He's thinking there's no way they're going to pick me. But he hears the crowd yell, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. What do you want me to do with Jesus? Crucify him. They yell all the louder. Barabbas is thinking, man, my day. This was meant to be the day that he would die. 
probably, probably that third cross was actually meant for him. And Barabbas might be the first guy to at least some degree say, man, Jesus died instead of me. All this, I think, points us back to Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, when it was basically the high priest would come and he would just say, I'm, this is the day that he is going to deal with the sins of the people, the sins of the people of Israel. And he would come and he would make, make payment basically for the sins of the people and he'd bring two goats with him and on one of the goats was, was the Lord's goat and this goat would be crucified or not crucified it'd be sacrificed and it would go uh, its blood would be sprinkled in the holy of holies that's like the most holy place the presence of God you'd only go once a year and it would be put on the altar the other goat the priest would lay his hands on the other goat and lay his hands on the head of the other goat. And basically he's like putting symbolically the, the sins of the people on this other goat. Right? So the other goat's being crucified. This one, it's, the sins are going on it. And then it's led out into the wilderness away from the city. And it escapes death. And, you know, it's kind of like it's called the scapegoat. But it's like the sins of that goat or the sins of the people are on that goat. And it's led away. Basically like the removal of sins. Now, sometimes I've heard it that people think that, well, Jesus is the goat that was sacrificed and Barabbas is the scapegoat. But that's actually, I don't think that's right. See, because both goats were required to make atonement for the sins. Both goats were required. So the first, Jesus is both goats. Jesus is the one that is the first goat that pays the price, that is sacrificed, that is crucified. But the other goat was symbolic of that the sins are gone away from the people. That they're removed, the guilt, the blame has put, been put on the goat, and now that the, the, it's gone far away. This is what Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 says. It says, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Right? You see that the goat that's, that's sacrificed. We all like sheep have gone astray. And each of us turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So who's Barabbas? Barabbas is, represents Israel, represents sinful Israel, represents us. I mean, think about how crazy this is. Barabbas, the guilty one, goes free. I mean, in, in, the, in the movies, we can't wait for the guilty person to get what's coming to them. We want justice. We want them to pay. And think, a lot of us, we, we have frustration with God. How can you allow this? How can you allow that? But the craziest thing that God allows is for sinners, people that are completely guilty, to be forgiven. That is the craziest thing that God does. The guilty are set free, and the innocent are put in the place of the guilty. That's the craziest thing. I mean, think about just people in, this, in the Bible. Think about Peter. Right during this time, he's denying Jesus when he flat out told Jesus he wouldn't. He's restored and forgiven. Think about David. Person that lied. Person that used their power to take full advantage of another woman. Lied about it. Murdered her husband to cover it up. Forgiven. What about later in the Bible, Paul? Paul that persecuted Christians. And even Paul writes, this is a trustworthy saying that Jesus came into this world to save sinners. How can God forgive them? How can, how can God forgive you? This is only a problem if somebody doesn't pay for what's been done. And Jesus did pay. Jesus was our substitute. Jesus in this time when he doesn't speak up to defend himself, it's because he's accepting the guilt, not of his own, but of ours. 
And I just want you to think a moment about your sin. Right? I'm not, I'm not saying this in a way to like shame you or to necessarily to make you feel bad. I'm asking you to do this so that we can see just a better picture of who Jesus is and what he's done. I just want you for a moment to think about your sin. Maybe it's now. Maybe it's in the past. What is something that you were like, man, I would never tell anybody? I don't even know if I'd tell God. What's something that makes you feel the absolute most shame about yourself? I mean, for me, I've put other things above God. I have thought that God wasn't really that good. I've wanted other things more than Him. I've many times wanted very little to do with God. I've poorly represented Jesus and looked nothing like Him, but even though I said that I believed in Him, I've yelled at my kids before. I've disciplined them totally out of anger. I've had bitterness and resentment towards others, where I even wanted the worst for them. I've lusted. I've, I've not given to others or been generous because I just don't care about them. I've not given to others because I just want to make sure that I have enough and that I'm secure. I've gossiped. I've cared way too much about what other people think of me. I've lied. I've exaggerated to make myself look better or others worse to get the approval of other people. I've craved what other people have. I've wanted their stuff. I've wanted their relationships. I've wanted their status. I've wanted their success. I've been jealous of the gifts of others. I've coveted others' success or even been angry when they were thought of highly. I've not gone to God because of my shame. I've not gone to him because I don't feel good enough. That in some way I have to feel that I have to prove myself to him. I feel unwanted and unloved by God even though he has never shown me that. I've wanted to stop following Jesus before. I've wanted to turn my back on him. Keep him at arm's length. I've cared very little for him even though he continues to pursue me time and time again. And yet what do we see? That Jesus didn't, he stayed up there. Jesus didn't come down. Jesus didn't save himself so that he could save me and so that he could save you. This passage tells us that Jesus didn't just die for us. Jesus died (laughs) instead of us. He was abandoned instead of me. He was betrayed instead of me. He suffered instead of me. He died instead of me. He paid the price for sin instead of me. And if you've trusted in Jesus... That is true for you. That he died, that he paid the price, that he was the substitute instead of you. Let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you that this is so, it's, it's, it's a hard passage to read. And when we just think about the physical things that you endured, the sufferings that you had, but yet it's, it's so beautiful, God. It's so good. And it's just so crazy to think that you, the completely innocent, holy, good Son of God, died in our place. Nobody even asked you to do it, but out of who you are, out of your holiness, out of your love, said, I will die for them. I will not save myself so that they can be saved. And so, Lord, I pray. God, that you would just help the truths of the gospel, the truths of Jesus Christ to sink deeper into our bones, deeper into everything that we are. Lord, because you're our Savior. You're our only hope. We just praise you for you, and we ask all this in your name. Amen.